Good afternoon, everyone. So thank you for joining us today. I'm Sam Sampson. I'm the product manager for Young Animal Nutrition here at Volac. And welcome to our Feed for Future webinar. So this is one as part of a series of events to make up for the AHDB and NFU Great British Calf Strategy Week. Before we begin, just to let you know that this session is recorded and we have several administrators on the call today. So if you do have any issues, please feel free to use the chat function on the bottom right hand screen. Um, bottom right of the screen. We will be saving all of today's questions um, until the end and we'll do our best to get through all of them. So again, please just use the chat function. You can send questions direct or you can um, have them visible for everybody to see. Either way, we've got plenty of people monitoring them. So some of the key areas of the Calf Strategy Week include to ensure that all calves are reared with care, so dairy bread and beef bread calves, to encourage responsible breeding strategies and to help open the supply chain for opportunities for dairy bred calves, as well as to support innovations and in R&D within the industry, something I know that we're all very passionate about. Today's take home message is very much about how cutting corners will not improve efficiencies on your farm. Our speakers will focus on feeding for growth and development through effective calf nutrition, as well as practical tips on how to improve the rearing environment while keeping sustainability and efficiency at the forefront of all of our minds. Dr. Jessica Cook is our first speaker today. She's Volac's Research and Development Manager, and we'll be discussing how to maximise efficiencies in feeding the pre-weaned calf. And Abby Reid will be sharing her top tips for better calf rearing and more efficient farm practices. We do have some polls as well. So um, throughout each session, there'll be a couple of polls. So it'd be really great if everybody could be involved in those. So a little introduction to Volac. We are a family run company based just outside of Cambridge and we have two divisions to our business, human sports nutrition and animal nutrition, predominantly in the dairy sector, which of course is why we're all here today. So before we do kick off, I'd like uh, to see if everybody could answer a poll, which um, I'm hoping one of my administrators is going to pop up onto the screen for me, which should be how, what does sustainability mean to you or how important is sustainability to you? So I don't know if everybody can see that. Just give that a couple of minutes. Right, so unfortunately, I can't see the results of that. If somebody could send me that, we'll pick that up at the end of my session. That'd be great. So what is Feed for Future? <clears throat> Feed for Future is an initiative set up by Volac in which we want to encourage the industry to do better for the future, beginning with looking after the future of our planet by using sustainable raw ingredients um, where we can and the future of our industry by giving back to uh, the industry where we can and the future of your farm um, and encouraging efficient and sustainable practices on farm to increase the longevity of your herd and the profitability of your business. So again, we've got another poll. I'm hoping one of our administrators can run that for me. It's what does sustainability mean for you? Um, and that should appear shortly. I'll just give a quick minute for that. Hopefully that one's gone through and again, we'll pick that up at the end. So just one quick note from Volac on uh, sustainability, something that we are proud of are the credentials that we have surrounding our palm products. You know, palm can be um, a really emotive word, but Volac um, subscribes to three commitments, which is to only use palm oil derivatives from sources that fulfill NDPE or RSPO certified sustainable palm oil. We also have transparency and traceability for all the palm oil derivatives and final products within our supply chain, as well as um, to actively promote the benefits of sustainable palm oil within the animal feed industry. All Volac branded milk replacers are made with sustainable palm oil and none of them contain soya. 
So these are our three pillars of Feed for Future again. So we're actually very proud to support the dairy industry and encourage the use of locally sourced and produced dairy products. We sit on several food and drink councils, as well as supporting Animal Health Island and AHDB amongst others. We also try to operate in a really sustainable way with regards to our manufacturing, with much of the power from our factory coming from an on-site biomass plant. We take locally sourced whey from the British cheese industry, which is supplied by local dairy farmers and turn it into high quality milk replacer to send back to the farmer to feed their calves. You know, this creates something that we call the milk circle that we're actually very, very proud to be part of. We also really want to help our farmers run efficient and sustainable herds by encouraging them to do the best by their calves. We spend a lot of time on farm and talking to our farmers, so we're aware of the great lengths, expense and resource that goes into responsible breeding, for example, using sex semen for high genetic merit heifer calf replacements. But all too often we see that the hard work and investment that's put into getting these calves can be undone. With what appear to be small things on farm, such as not having a cold weather protocol or not feeding enough. In addition, we are all here today to support the calf strategy week. So for true efficiencies, it's important that those dairy bred male calves are bred with the right genetics to help maximize their value. All too often we see that these calves are bred and then not invested in, which now with the encouragement of these calves staying on farm for eight to 12 weeks, we'd like to see their value maximized in order to increase their selling options as well as to help change the sometimes negative consumer perceptions surrounding these animals. This will make for an efficient herd and a sustainable business and a healthy dairy industry. If you do have any questions or queries or would like more information on sustainability or any of the topics covered today, do feel free to pop a question into the chat box or you can check out the Feed for Growth website or email feedforgrowth at volac.com. I'm now gonna hand over to Dr. Jessica Cook who will talk to you about maximizing efficiencies. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can all see the um, screen with my slides being shared and can hear me. So I am Dr. Jessica Cook, Volax Research and Development Manager, responsible for the Young Animal Nutrition R&D. I'm really pleased to be joining you today um, for this webinar and being part of the Great British Calf Week because I have spent much of my life um, connected with the dairy industry. I grew up on a dairy farm in Sussex, and then I went on to complete a PhD at the Royal Veterinary College, where I was looking at the importance of factors during the calf rearing period and the impact that these have on the subsequent performance um, of the animals once they enter the milking herd. So data that I collected during my PhD, um, together with data from subsequent studies, has consistently shown that heifers calving down close to 24 months of age are those that have the best lifetime performance. So heifers calving close to 24 months of age have been shown to have better fertility, so fewer days to conception in lactation one and lactation two, and significantly lower calving intervals. Heifers calving at 24 months have um, the best milk production, so they've been shown to have higher milk production over the first five years of their life, and importantly, higher lifetime daily yields, which is clearly what is important. Heifers calving um, at younger ages have also been shown to have improved udder health. So it's been shown that a lower age at first calving is actually associated with a lower somatic cell count in their first lactation. So taken together, this better fertility, more milk, better udder health, it results in these heifers actually having improved longevity. And it's been shown that it's the heifers that are calving down close to 24 months of age that have a much better chance of actually reaching a third calving. We know that heifers calving for the first time at 24 months of age don't actually become profitable until halfway through lactation too. Therefore, it is fundamental that the heifers that we're rearing on our farm today actually survive until third calving to stay in the herd long enough to pay back that investment cost. So if heifers are to carve down at 24 months of age um, with adequate body size, we need to set targets throughout the rearing period to ensure that heifers are on the right growth curve and ultimately um, maximise the chance of growing better cows. 
Now, we all put a lot of focus on age at first carving, but actually it's really important they're the right body size. So at first carving, we need these heifers to be 85 to 90 percent of their mature body weight. And that's important because it um, reduces any carving difficulties and also their body size at first carving has been linked with their subsequent fertility. So by making sure that you carve down at the right age and size, you're going to improve their subsequent performance. So to hit this target, we need to go back to day one and set them off on the right growth curve. So the first goal should be to double their birth weight by weaning. And then the next one is to be um, getting them the right size to breed for the first time at 13 to 14 months of age. And at this point, you want them to be 55 to 60 percent of their mature body weight. Now, it's important that we start breeding them at 13 to 14 months, because if they're to carve at 24 months, they clearly have to be in calf by 15 months. So we need to start breeding them at 13 to 14 months to give them enough time to actually get in calf to then um, be in calf by 15 months. So if we're aiming for 55 to 60 percent of mature body weight at 13 months of age, this equates to a daily life weight gain from day one through to 13 months of around 0.8 kilos per day. But of course, it will depend on the mature body weight of cows in your herd, but it's going to be close to sort of 0 0.7, 0 0.8 kilos per day. So whether you are rearing a heifer as a future herd replacement and trying to hit the growth targets that we've just looked at, or whether you're rearing the dairy beef calves and want to maximise their future value and selling options, we need to ensure that every calf on farm gets off to the best possible start. And the critical focus areas for success include the health, the environment and the nutrition. So calves use their feed in lots of different ways. First, they must use it to maintain their um, normal body functions. Then they use it to keep themselves warm and to fight any diseases. And then finally, it's the balance that's left over that they can then use and put into their growth. This means that if you've got a healthy, warm calf, it uses its um, energy most efficiently and has plenty available for growth. If we compare this to the sick cold calf, it's going to grow inefficiently and very slowly, simply because it has to use more of its energy that's going in in the feed to keep itself warm and to fight disease by mounting that immune response. So it has very little energy left over for growth. And when we're talking about environmental temperature for the young calf less than three weeks of age, anything less than 10 to 15 degrees C is cold for that calf. And at those temperatures, that calf, the young calf, is going to have to be using more of its energy to keep itself warm. So for the rest of my talk, I'm going to sort of focus on the nutritional side. And so going to start um, with colostrum management and achieving early and adequate intake of colostrum is widely recognized as the single most important management factor in determining the health and survival of calves. But it also has been shown to have long term benefits in terms of calf growth and development. So it's key that we get it right. And there's sort of the four um, key points to remember about colostrum is firstly we need to get the colostrum into the calves um, quickly so you need to collect it and feed it within two hours of calving and that's because at birth the calf gut is extremely permeable to these um, large uh, antibody molecules and gradually over the first 24 hours that gut starts to close so the sooner you can get it into that calf the more of those antibodies can actually be absorbed by the by the gut the next factor is the quality of the colostrum and um, colostrum quality can vary enormously between individual cows and you can't determine the quality of colostrum simply by looking at it you actually need to be testing it so either with a bricks or a colostrometer and if you're using bricks, it needs to be more than 22%. And if you're using clostrometer, it needs to be greater than 50 grams per litre. In terms of quantity, um, as a minimum, we need to be feeding three litres within the first two hours, followed by a further three litres within 12 hours. And um, 
you know this there's there is data now showing that actually um although the antibodies can't be absorbed beyond 24 hours by feeding colostrum for the first three days and even your transition milk for the first week that will actually have benefits in terms of um, gut development and health and then the final consideration is to keep the colostrum clean and um, bacterial contamination reduces the uptake of those antibodies and Bacterial contamination can occur um, from poor colostrum handling, so it's important that we keep all the feeding equipment clean, but it can also result from inadequate storage. So if you are storing colostrum rather than feeding it straight to the calf, it needs to be in that fridge or in the freezer, ideally within an hour of collection to stop any of the bacterial growth. Um, because sort of, bacteria can uh, double every 20 minutes when left at room temperature. So this um, is some data from some recent studies in Ireland um, looking at colostrum management on farms. So the first um, figures are based on 66 dairy farms in Northern Ireland, and they found that 77% of farms fed three litres or more of colostrum in the first feed, which is great. So we're getting the quantity into them. A second study looking at 47 Irish herds found that 76% of farms fed colostrum with two, within two hours, which as well um, is great to see that so many farms are getting that colostrum in quickly. But going back to the first study based on the um, farms in Northern Ireland, they found that only 14% of farms actually tested colostrum quality. And I think it's just really important um, to note that it's the sort of testing that quality is key because if it's of a poor quality to start with and you've got a low level of those antibodies present then it's not going to have the desired effect because if the antibodies aren't there to start with the calf can't absorb them and no matter how much you feed or how quickly you feed if it's of a poor quality you're not going to get the desired level of passive transfer that you'd hope for. So moving on to um, milk feeding, the primary source of nutrition for a calf during the first three to four weeks of life is milk, and that's because starter intake is minimal. So feeding more milk, i.e. providing more energy to those calves for a few days of age, will help to maximise feed efficiency, prevent early weight loss, and maximise early growth potential. And I'm going to go through each of those points in the next few slides. Feeding um, more milk has also been shown to improve the health of these young calves, and that's because mounting an immune response is a considerable energetic demand. So if you put more energy into them, they're in a much better place to fight those disease challenges. And it's actually been shown that calves that are fed more milk are much better able to withstand disease challenges from crypto, salmonella and respiratory disease better. Early nutrition is also important for developmental programming. So what happens to a cow's performance in the milking herd will be influenced by her early life development. And it's been shown that pre weaning growth and nutrition have been associated with first lactation performance. So looking at feed efficiency, so feed efficiency is defined as the relative ability of the animal to turn feed nutrients into growth, and it's at its highest during the milk feeding period. So on this graph here, you can see that in the first two months, um, feed efficiency is up at 50%. So what this would mean is if you're feeding 100 grams of feed, you would expect around 50 grams of growth back out in ideal um, environmental conditions. By the time this calf has been weaned and sort of approaching four to five months, the feed efficiency has dropped down to 36%. And then at the point of, sort of first breeding, it's down at less than 10%. So it's easy to see that for the same amount of feed, as that animal ages, you're going to get less growth back out. So we need to take advantage of that high feed efficiency in the first two to three months of their life and maximise their growth. So thinking about the growth potential of these young calves, this was some data um, that were from a study carried out at Liverpool University a few years ago, and they were feeding two groups of calves. One group, they were feeding restricted volumes of milk. So those calves were getting five litres of milk per day, 
over the first three weeks. And then the other group were being fed ad lib from day one. So you can see here that by day five, they were drinking around seven and a half litres per day. And then by day 26, they were drinking um, upwards of 13 litres per day. They found that the biggest difference in um, growth rate was actually over the first two to three weeks of life, which is expected because that's when they're completely reliant on their milk feed because starter intake is um, minimal over the first couple of weeks. So when looking at this graph here, um, you've got body weight against age over the first 14 days. Looking at the blue line, which is those restricted fed calves, you can see that these calves actually lost some of their birth weight. And it wasn't until around sort of day three to four that they'd actually regain their birth weight and then grew very slowly. So by day 14, they'd put on only around two kilos. And over the first three weeks of life, they had a growth rate recorded of only 0.17 kilos per day. Looking at the ad lib fed calves, you can see that from day two, these calves simply thrived and grew. By day 14, they had put on seven kilos and over the first three weeks, they were having um, growth rates of around 0.7 kilos per day. So, you know, it just shows that if we provide these young calves with enough milk, over the first few weeks of life, they've got an enormous potential for growth. And we know that over the first two weeks, calves do experience significant health and environmental stresses, which is why it's really important that we actually feed them enough milk to allow them to grow. So how much milk should we be feeding these young calves? Well, traditionally, we would have built up the amount of milk offered quite slowly and then rapidly wean them. But what we actually need to do is flip that milk curve on its head. So we need to feed these young calves more milk from an early age and then actually wean them more gradually. So following the um, colostrum feeding period from around day seven, you need to be getting these calves on around six litres of milk per day. If you're going to take that um, milk allowance up further, um, you need to meet, reach the peak milk allowance by around two weeks of age. And it's by feeding them more from this um, from day seven and over the first sort of two to five weeks of their life. That's what's very much going to help support the health, the growth and the development of these young calves. Just a note on meal size. If you are feeding twice a day and want to go beyond feeding six litres of milk per day, then um, you should really be sort of keeping maximum meal size to three litres per feed. So if you do want to increase your volume beyond six litres, then you'd have to think about introducing a third feed. What is then is important is that we wean these calves over a three week weaning period. And that's important to stimulate starter intake, stimulate the rumen development, which will then benefit their digestibility and ultimately ensure these calves are better equipped to cope with the weaning transition. And I will come back to starter intake and weaning um, towards the end of my presentation. This milk feeding curve should be used as a guide only because you know, the target for every farm should be to double birth weight by weaning. So if you're not managing to um, make sure every calf has doubled their birth weight by weaning, we need to go back and look at the triangle of the health, the environment and the nutrition, you know, what bits not working. And you may need to um, feed more milk um, to suit your system, to suit the environmental challenges and ensure that those calves are all doubling their birth weight by weaning. In addition to feeding more milk um, to maximise growth, the type and the quality of the ingredients in a milk replacer will also determine calf performance. So this was a trial that we carried out recently where we were feeding calves either a milk formula based on a high level of Immunipro, which is our concentrated whey protein and phospholipid base, and comparing it to calves being fed a milk formula with a low level of Immunipro. And what we found was that the calves being fed the milk formula with a high inclusion level of Immunipro grew faster. So they were on average four kilos heavier at weaning on day 56 compared to those calves being fed the milk formula with a low inclusion level of Immunipro. 
So it just shows that um, not only is it the amount we're feeding, but actually what's in the milk replacer will all sort of determine the calf growth and development. And actually, if you choose the right milk formula, will help to support the growth and health of those calves. So when thinking about sort of milk replacers, um, you need to be choosing one that's right for your calves. So is it your replacement heifers that you're rearing or is it the dairy beef calves that you're rearing and, and choose an appropriate milk formula? Always check the ingredients and use one based on sort of good quality ingredients. And then key things to remember is, is sort of the, always check you're mixing it um, as recommended and um, check the mixing and feeding temperature and again use thermometers to just check that you are feeding at the right temperature and of course with any young animal hygiene and consistency is key so feeding more milk um, will help maximize the growth health and long-term development of these animals but actually feeding more milk may delay solid feed intake simply because the high milk fed calf won't be driven by hunger to eat the starter. Any delays in solid in feed intake can then compromise rumen development, leading to poor growth and feed efficiency in the weeks immediately after weaning. So, you know, when especially when we're feeding higher volumes of milk, it is critical that we manage that weaning transition properly. And we need to balance the intake of nutrients from both milk and solid feed in the last few weeks of weaning. So by balancing the nutrients from milk and solid feed, we're going to maximise the nutrient intake because obviously you want that calf eating as much solid feed alongside its milk as possible. You'll help ensure good rumen development at weaning. And rumen development is largely driven by the fermentation of the starter by the rumen bacteria. And, you know, so the more starter that calf is eating, the better the um, rumen will be developed. And that's really important because when you come to wean these calves, the day you remove the milk, they're completely reliant on the starter. And unless you've got a well-developed rumen, it won't actually be able to utilize and digest the nutrients in that starter. Balancing um, the nutrients from the milk and the solid feed will also help maximize the feed efficiency. And, the feed efficiency is the highest during the milk feeding period, but actually it still remains relatively high immediately after weaning. So um, the more they're eating at weaning, the more you're going to maximise that sort of relatively high feed efficiency um, at that point. It will help maintain um, growth and um, reduce the risk of any setbacks around weaning. Um, again, because you know the more starter they're eating, obviously the more nutrients they're taking on, but the more starter they're eating, the better develop that rumen so they can actually go on to utilize and digest the nutrients. And then there is also data showing that weaning dry matter intake is pos positively related to their first lactation performance. So, the general recommendation is to wean calves when they're consuming between one and a half to two kilos of starter per day. But as I said, it can be a challenge to get these high milk fed calves to eat the starter. But um, various studies have now shown that um, sort of dietary and management factors can help encourage starter intake in these high milk fed calves. So firstly, um, providing palatable fresh starter and water from day one is absolutely key. Social housing, so pairing or grouping your calves from day seven um, can actually help encourage starter intake. And that's because of the peer stimulation that the calves get from each other. They see another calf eating, so then they eat more themselves. Providing chopped forage ad lib and separately from the starter, so ideally in a separate bucket from the starter, has also been shown to encourage starter intake. And that's because the function of that forage is not nutritional. It sort of functions as helping to keep the rumen healthy. Um, so by keeping that rumen healthier, it actually encourages the calf to eat more starter. And then finally, we need to reduce the milk over a three week weaning period. And, um, you know, this will very much help drive the starter intake in the run up to weaning and make sure you've got a well-developed 
room in at weaning so that the calf can actually digest those nutrients and um, it's been shown that it very much is the cumulative amount of starter that they've eaten in the run-up to weaning that's important um, for rumen development. So just to um, summarise before I hand over to Abby, um, calving heifers at 24 months of age is associated with increased survivability and increased lifetime yield, creating an efficient and sustainable system. And whether it's the replacement heifers or the dairy beef calves, we need to get them all off to the best possible start and get the nutrition, the health and the environment right. So take advantage of the high feed efficiency in the first two to three months and maximise their growth potential. Use a high quality milk formula to help support better calf growth, development and health. And finally, um, you know, Look, do those sort of various different management um, treatments to help encourage starter intake so that you basically um, make sure that calf is better equipped to cope with the weaning transition and you don't see any setbacks in growth around weaning. I haven't gone into detail um, in it today and I think Abby's going to pick up on it, but we do need to be measuring and monitoring heifers. Firstly, that's important to sort of highlight any groups that aren't quite hitting the targets and then you can do something about it. But actually also, if you're doing everything right and heifers um, are growing extremely well, then we need to be measuring them so that the minute they hit that 55 to 60% of mature body weight, we can start breeding them, get them in calf, get them on their way to calving down at 24 months and ultimately entering the milking herd and yielding some profits. Thank you very much. I look forward to um, taking questions um, after Abby's presentation. Thanks, Jessica. So before we move on to Abby, um, I thought we'd try and activate your polls to see uh, who's still with us. That was really great. And I think, um, you know, one of my take home messages from your talk was, you know, getting that room and development really is key. So I'm going to run one of your polls now, which is what age do you carve the majority of your heifers at? Be interesting to see this one. So everybody, hopefully they'll be able to see this on the right hand side of their screen if they can click on the app side and um, let's see what people say. Oh. So we've got the majority, a whopping majority at currently 82%, 83% says they're carving at 23 to 25 months. Jessica, have you got any comment on that? Is that exactly what you were hoping to see there? Um, all I can say is that's super to see um, and keep up the good work. Brilliant. And let's see who's testing the quality of their colostrum. So question here on the right hand side, do you test the quality of all of the colostrum fed? Oh, we creep, we're creeping up on the nose, nose there, but still the majority saying yes. Jessica, have you got any words on a quick, quick round up on the importance of testing quality? Yeah, I think, as I said, um, you know, actually testing the quality is important because it does vary enormously between cows and you can't tell the quality just by looking at it and like anything you know if the starting quality is not good to start with then um, no matter how quickly or how much you feed um, if the antibodies aren't there then the calf won't be able to absorb them and you won't get the desired effect in terms of passive transfer so it's just really important to take that time if you're going to the time of getting the colostrum into the calves um, make sure you test it and complete the circle. Brilliant. I think um, our recommended um, mechanism of testing is using a Brick's refractometer. So for those of you that follow us on Facebook, if you keep an eye out, we do tend to give them away in uh, competition posts. So uh, you have to keep your eyes peeled for that. So I am now going to hand over to Abby Reader. Abby, welcome. All right, thanks very much, Sam, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us today and celebrating Great British Calf Week, which is is all about just trying to, I don't know, just get better at what we do. Um, certainly in terms of my talk, I'm not here to teach anybody to suck eggs. I'm not an expert. I can tell you about my experiences, and it'd be really good to get a bit of feedback from those of you who are listening to, you know, say whether you've tried something and it has worked or it hasn't worked for you, or you've heard a better idea. Um, in terms of my own background, Ground and milking approximately 200 cows. We're milking. Um, I'm just about to start even farm. Um, 
There's my sorry. I've got to manage all of the carving. Abby, we've just got a bit of interference. I didn't know if you could just turn your video off. Sometimes with the bandwidth, it slow it slows yeah. the the speech down. Pops a uh, delay on it. Okay, what's that like now? Can you still hear me? We can still hear you, but unfortunately we can't see you. But please carry on. Yep. Okay. Well, that's okay. You can all sit there and imagine me. Um, right. So into yeah. So in terms of background, I'm milking 200 cows all year round calving, um, and really it's about trying to pick all the points up that Jessica's made, which are absolutely fantastic, and applying them onto you know, a real life farm. So it was great to see some of the photographs of those calves in the, in some really fantastic facilities. The reality is on my farm, our calves are reared in 18th century stone barns uh, in old stables, and they have been kitted out for the modern day calf, but at the same time, they are still old stone barns and slate roofs. And I think where we can invest in these, these new facilities is absolutely fantastic, but I don't think you should be down on yourself if you do have facilities that are a little bit more restricted, much like mine. Um, so what we do in terms of breeding, um, we've stopped buying conventional semen. We use only sex semen and beef semen. And the aim is to breed 35% of our very best cows to sex semen. And then the rest will go to an Aberdeen Angus beef. And that's all on an integrated scheme. Uh, in the real world, I am living in a, a bit of a TB hiccup at the moment. So we're currently breeding about 50% of our hairs to sex semen and 50% to beef. But, you know, it, it, it's all sort of, it all comes out in the wash. In terms of what do we do with these calves? It's really important that they're all treated the same. They've all got a value. Um, and I quite like being part of an integrated beef scheme because it does help me understand how much more of a value I've got further down the chain. Um, what I will be aiming for is weights of approximately 45 kilograms for our continentals and some of our smaller dairy heifers by three weeks. Um, and then for our black and white bulls and, and obviously our bigger dairy heifers, and we're aiming for those to be 50 kilograms by three weeks. So those are, those are more or less our targets. In terms of the journey that we've done on the farm, actually what I did a few months ago was, um, I hired a calf rearer to do the job for us. And I understand it, labor is really complicated out there and trying to find somebody who will rear calves is quite niche, especially because you only want them for a few hours in the morning and a few hours in the evening, depending on your herd size. Um, but the hiring of this calf rearer has absolutely blown my brain because we bought someone, she's new into the industry. She's come from outside, former opera singer. Um, and we've managed to get her trained up, but what she's done is pointed out to me all of the ways that I have been cutting corners in terms of calf rearing. And, you know, sometimes that's making sure that you, know, you are feeding absolutely the same time every day. But also it's making sure that the first thing she wanted was a whiteboard to put the plan up there. So we saw Jessica's um, slide on the, um, the milk feeding curve and how you should be feeding you know, six to eight liters in those first sort of five weeks, and then you should start to step down. We were doing that, but we were doing it largely off the top of my head. Um, whereas she bought, because she didn't have anything else to fall back on, this became very clinical. Um, and we all had to fall in line because I wanted my calf rear, whose name is Louise. Um, I wanted her to have full control of, of the system so that she felt like that was her little niche. So we had to make sure then that we all fell in line behind her. And if anybody was, was, um, feeding the calves on her off days, we all had to copy exactly what she did. And because it was all up on the whiteboard, it was very simple for people to see. And suddenly it became a lot easier for me to pull in other members of staff if I needed to at busy times to, to pick up some of the workload because all of the data was there. Now, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of, of whiteboards and, and notes. A lot of things do go on in my head. But with calf rearing, we can't afford to, to cut these corners. And that's something that she's taught me and she taught it me very well. Likewise, out came away scales to start weighing our um, dry feed. Have we got time for these things? Have we got time to not do those things is what I started to learn. You really need to start getting on top of some of these, they're, they're small wins, but they'll all add up to something a lot bigger. Um, so yeah, that's been really great. And I have got a poll actually, which I thought I would run at the minute if that's okay, Sam. 
in terms of looking at who, well, do you have somebody who's a dedicated car freer or, or not? So I don't know if you want to run that a minute. I will run that. Should we see if we can pop your video back on? Let's yeah. See if, uh, yeah. The, band, the bandwidth is uh, going to play ball. Do you have dedicated calf rearer? Can everybody see that on the right hand side? Let's let's see what the votes are looking like. Oh. Can you see the answers for those coming up on your screen, Abby, as well? I will. I can't, I'm afraid. No. See, that's what we like to do, keep the speakers in the dark about the answers. <laughs> so we have got 28% of people saying that, yes, one person takes responsibility. The mm. overwhelming majority is we have a few people who look after the calves, somewhere mm. around 46%. People are people are moving their answers around. Um, anybody who's available is looking after the calves is a 15%. And then we've got 7% at other. So we've yeah. Got it's it's a really difficult balance and for those people who who put the option of anybody who is available i don't think you should beat yourself up about that but again if i draw back to what i've learned from having a dedicated car era it's trying to get a better flow of communication between all of you so that everybody knows what's going on and it does actually make life a lot happier when you do it and and as i'm the manager it, it's my responsibility to make sure that anybody who is looking after our calves understands what they may or may not need to do with a certain animal and and it, it, it certainly has made life a lot easier so I, i've learned a lot in that respect um and probably if we move on to to one of the key points of calf rearing which is colostrum and colostrum management that is where we saw some of our biggest gains um about 10 years ago when i did realize that if you've got a team rely on them more people like to help they like to be involved uh, and we started getting a system where we said, right, if anybody is walking around the yard, can you always make sure you go via the carving yard? And if you see an animal that looks like she's about to carve, carving, whatever it is, go straight to the freezer and get colostrum out and start defrosting it. And it, it made life so much easier because then it wasn't just me who was having to defrost that colostrum um, and thinking, oh, right, you know, I've. I've got to wait an extra half hour now because I need this, this colostrum to de defrost because somebody had already been there and done it for me. And it, it, it just made life a lot simpler. And it, it brought us a lot of gains in terms of making sure that we had better growth on our calves because we were more on it. And also I felt a bit better because it meant that I could finish on time a lot more often. Um, and, you know, that always goes down really well. In terms of colostrum as well, so we've had the, the, um, the points made about the BRICS refractometer. And, and do people measure colostrum? So I think, again, if I was putting on my, you know, bringing in the practical side for this, um, I understand that if I've got colostrum in front of me and I measure it and it doesn't quite come up to spec, if that's all I've got, that's all I've got. And there's not a lot I can do about it. So sometimes that might put you off measuring. But actually, if you can just use a refractometer and they're about £20 on Amazon, £16 sometimes, if, if if you get it really lucky. If you can just measure that colostrum before it goes into the calf, you at least know where you stand. Um, and you have got the option. You could feed a bit more. You can try and make sure, you know, Jessica said about how important it is to try and keep feeding that over the three days and really transition milk right the way up to, to seven days. It does get all of these marginal gains. Uh, and certainly for, for deciding on colostrum for freezing, the, the refractometer is a no-brainer. No you want a milk that is 22% and above, and you want to get that in the freezer and keep it, and then you know it's reliable. But again, I'm going to put my little farmer spin on this. If you've got lower quality colostrum, there's no harm in bottling up some of that and also putting it in the freezer. But mark it, and then you know that if you reach point desperate, for some reason you've used a lot of colostrum lately, and, and you haven't, at least you've got something. Um, and that's what we do. And in terms of freezing, um, I'm probably a bit like the rag and bone man because I will go around and pick up people's old fridges and freezers all the time. You can go onto sites like Gumtree and see if people are getting rid of chest freezers. It's such a brilliant way. You know, I've got uh, three fridge freezers on the yards at the minute that are waiting to be plugged in. We'll, we'll throw one out about every every three years. It's usually someone's second hand, but it's a really good way to just just keep um, freezers on the farm without having to spend a lot of money. And, you know, you, you can make sure then you've got lots of space. And if you have got spare space, then you can just keep filling it up and filling it up. So and it will help you to think of, of colostrum going on there. Also, it's probably worth noting that you can calibrate the refractometer. 
So you need to do that. You can get a couple of drops of water, put it on there. You wait, I don't know, 10 to 20 seconds just for it to come up to, to room temperature and then look at it as normal. And you want, if it's if your refractometer is working correctly, it will be on 0%. Um, if it's not, there's a little screw on the side of it that you can just turn just to adjust it. So um, sometimes it's worth doing that because we know what it's like you can drop them and um, do various things with them. So just make sure that it's working properly for you. But it, it is, it's definitely worth measuring that colostrum. Know where you stand, at least know what's coming at you down the track. Um, so the once we've done the colostrum, I mean, obviously the key things then as as car freer is for, for all of us is dealing with sickness or mortality. Uh, and if we pick up sickness first, and I think Sam is, well, hopefully Sam can run another poll for us now. So we're going to ask you the question, which is, um, what is your biggest issue when car freering? And I actually ran this poll about five months ago as well. So is it calf scour? Is it pneumonia? Um, or is it disappointing growth? So if everybody could fill that out. That's that's running now. Oh, wait, we had a 50-50 a split for a couple of seconds there. <laughs> oh, I think we've settled out. So it seems to be overwhelming majority have got the answer the biggest issue is calf scour. Pneumonia and disappointing calf growth rates are pretty close together and then we've got an eight percent at other. We seem to have settled on scour being the the biggest issue. Now that, that's interesting because when I ran this poll about five months ago it was so close it was just between scour and pneumonia but pneumonia just got it um, and when was that? That was back in the autumn. It's quite a contentious issue actually people seem to be quite adamant which which are their biggest problems. Um, in terms of both of them, obviously, once you've managed to sort the colostrum out uh, and remember any win that you can get, even if you can't achieve the faction all the time, any win that you can get is pushing you towards that better target and you will get better at what you do. Um, but key to scour or pneumonia are, are two words, and that's warm and dry. And it, it, that will cover a whole host of things. I was speaking. It's always great when you speak to all sorts of um, different people in the industry. But one of the best um, bits of information I got is that a calf will inhale pathogens in water vapor. So if your calf is in a, in a damp environment and there happen to be pathogens circulating, that pathogen is going to lock itself onto that moisture and the calf will inhale it. And then if you add on to that, if the calf is a little bit cold, it's not great at fending off that pathogen that it's inhaled because it's not working as effectively, then you've got a big problem. So warm and dry are, are absolutely key, really, or, or what we've learned to controlling everything. And I was looking at some, some stats um, the other night in preparation for this. So we do vaccinate our calves for pneumonia. Um, and it costs me six pound a calf, which is approximately 1300 pounds a year. But equally, I do have to ask myself, how much should you know how much more should i be investing in more straw to keep those calves warm and to keep them dry um there are little things as well if you're cleaning out the calf pens our calf pens are very rarely totally empty so we're not a block car but we can't just empty all the calves out clean the whole thing down and, and put a pressure washer on because there's there's other calves around be very careful how much water you've got circulating in that environment so we do we'll muck out a a calf pen we'll dry brush it out and then we put a lot of lime down um and you know hopefully you can give it about seven days to rest that doesn't always happen either but if you can rest that pen for a certain amount of time as well before another calf goes back in that's really good um i find cleaning up calf pens is a great job if you can get hold of some students which are usually quite willing throughout the the um you know the various holidays you know, people are always willing to come and help, but somebody needs to be on top of cleaning those calf pens out. Every time a calf goes in, it's got to go in a, in a fresh pen. And I appreciate that sometimes things go wrong. But if again, if you can try and aim for perfection, even if you don't quite hit it, you're getting partway there. And, and you know, anything that you can do to, to propel yourself forward is really good. Um, so if we're talking about warmth as well, obviously, there's the argument with jackets um and i've heard some people say oh you know there's there's no data there to prove that that jackets work It'd be great to get jessica's opinion at the end of this but um there's no there's no data there really to show whether jackets really do work or not but would you not put one on um what are they they're about 25 pounds each it's worth doing um i think generally perhaps a lamp can do a lot better and i am considering at the moment so my calves are in these these 18th century stables 
um, and they largely in groups of five and wondering whether I should be putting a, um, an infrared lamp in each pen and, and using that to keep them warm. But at the moment, our carbs are in jackets. We do have, it was great to hear Sam mention, you know, do you have a winter protocol? And I was thinking, oh, I'm not really sure that I have got a winter protocol. But as I was sat here listening to it, actually, we did, because you know, the temperature starts to get colder. The jackets come out. Everybody checks they're clean before they go on. We know that we start getting up. We keep um, boards like stock boards, plastic stock boards. They go up in front of all the carp pens to stop drafts coming in. We'll put other boards then up over the top of the carp pens just towards the back to try and stop drafts coming down on top of the carp. So anything like that that you can do to try and help the air keep circulating, but at the same time, keep those carbs warm. Those are little bits that, that we've learned along the journey. Um, so that would be the key thing on that. I've got two things left to cover then. So a little bit on weaning. Um, when you wean a calf, I was taught at college and frighteningly, I worked out that's, a, that's over, well, it's almost 20 years ago, which does scare me a little bit. Um, but when I was at college 20 years ago, that's what we were taught when we, when you weaned the calf, you just stopped. The kindest thing was to just stop feeding them. That was it. Now, as I, um, you know, as we sort of got into a bit more research on that, I suppose, and we started picking up what was going on in the industry, we realized that actually, no, you need to start step weaning. So what we did as, as a, a farm that feeds our calves twice daily, um, we use a milk bar feeder. Um, and the milk is put in the calves can have as much as they like in the morning as much as they like in the night um, but otherwise we we remove it so what we started doing was dropping the afternoon feed so that you just feed the calves in the morning and they're not in the afternoon but what I've learned again now in the last sort of four to five years is actually that's not good enough and it might be great for you because you think great you know in the afternoons I've only got to feed 20 calves instead of 40 or, or whatever it may be but really, those calves need to have a little bit less in the morning and a little bit less in the afternoon rather than rather than just cutting them off. And that's because when you come around to feeding time, those calves are mentally setting themselves up to receive milk. So their stomach is preparing, it, preparing itself to receive that milk and it never gets there. And it can create a buildup of a neg negative environment in that gut, which isn't really very healthy for it. So it, it, it is generally about trying to get that finesse of cutting them back slowly over three weeks. Um, in the morning and in the night and preparing them and making sure that they are eating enough hard feed by the time you wean so that you can get the best out of them so that's what we do with weaning and then dehorning um we we've been weaning uh sorry we've been dehorning at eight weeks for i don't know 10 20 years latterly though we have started now dehorning under three weeks of age um we use something called horned up so the aim is when the calf is is actually I don't know, less than 14 days old, that the bud that is um, the start of the horn is sort of floating under the skin. I'm sorry for very, very basic phrasing, but that's more or less what it's doing. It's floating under the skin. It's not really until about three weeks of age that it will anchor itself to the skull. So what we do for dehorning then is we'll catch the calf as normal, give it a local anaesthetic. Then you use horned up, which is um, quite a high heating... Um, dehorning contraption but you can use your gas dehorner it's all the same but you'll hold it onto the bud and um if you've got if you've got a horn up it'll count for you but if not you count count to about 10 seconds just holding it on that on that bud um and then take it off and it will kill all of the nerves around the bud and it will just naturally drop out and we found that that's a much much lower stress level for the calves and in terms of giving a growth check um, it it works really well for us. It's a really nice, neat dehorning. It's another job that's done when the calf is is a bit smaller and, and not quite so vulnerable. Clearly, make sure that you give him Metacam as well. I cannot promote Metacam enough. You know, if you've got any anything, whether you're dehorning, but likewise, if you if you are suspicious that a calf might be getting slightly sick, get in there quick with the Metacam. Um, you can keep a thermometer and and keep an eye on that as well, just to see what the calf's doing. But it is so important to get on top of that pain relief. And if you can um, offset any bigger problems that might be coming at you down the line, that will save you so much time um, and make sure that that calf remains ha happy and healthy. So in terms of what I've learned, that more or less covers it. I don't think I'm going to um, go on much further, but it'd be great to get a bit of feedback from people who've been listening um, and see what you all think. So thanks very much, Sam. Thanks very much for 
that, Abby. Um, so we're going to move on to some questions now, but you want a little bit of feedback and some feedback we have had is um, about a point you've made that says, good point about have you got time to not do it properly in regards to, to calf rearing? You know, how much time does it really take to treat a poorly calf? Um, I think, you know, you've made that point that, you know, and Jessica did as well, by cutting corners, actually, you don't increase efficiencies and actually it will cost you more time and resource in the long run as well. So, lots of interesting comments coming through on calf jackets. I see we've got um, a link shared as well, which is really interesting. So, like you've said, Abby, would, why would you not put a calf jacket on? So, um, one question I've had in, which I think you've answered was, do calf jackets work? Mm. Yeah, it, it's a really good point. Um, like I say, I, I have been told there's no data on it. I don't know if Jessica would know any different, but again, it's it's £25 a calf. They last quite a long time, even with quite um, savage washing. And they're a no brainer. We put a jacket on. So why wouldn't you put one on a calf? Uh, the key thing that we've noticed, we, we will leave them on for quite a long time. Sometimes it might stay on the calf up till weaning, depending. By that point, they can look a little bit like capes, not jackets. So the key thing is to make sure that you keep loosening it, loosening that jacket so that the calves are growing with it. But yeah, I, you know, I'm all for them. Brilliant. Um, few comments and questions coming in on colostrum here as well. In one that we we get quite quite a lot actually is how long can colostrum be stored in the fridge and in the freezer before quality deteriorates, and how is it best to defrost frozen colostrum? I know that's something lots of people struggle with. Shall I pick up first and then I'll hand over to you, Abby? Um, but in terms of sort of recommendations for how long you'd keep it in the fridge for, um, you know, up to 24 hours is the ideal time in the fridge. Um, and I think Abby sort of touched on this actually with fridge and your freezer, check your temperatures of your fridges as well to make sure they're actually working. So, you know, if it's in the fridge for 24 hours, make sure your fridge is at four degrees C and functioning properly. Um, in terms of storing it in the freezer, the recommendation is of up to a year um, in the freezer at minus 18 to minus 20 degrees C. Um, defrosting, um, never ever put it in the microwave because the high heat will destroy those valuable um, antibodies, which is what you want to get into the calf. Um, and I think, you know, it's, there's no simple way of defrosting it, but, um, you know, one recommendation is to pop it in the fridge overnight, but you can't always do that because you don't know what's, um, what you're going to need the next day. Um, another way is to sort of um, defrost it gently in a, a sort of a warm water bath type system. Again, just be wary of your water temperatures. So 50 degrees C is sort of the maximum temperature you should use for the water um, and then be feeding it at sort of body temperatures of 38 degrees C. Um, and again, just you know, to ease the defrosting process, store it in small quantities and again, sort of in like use sandwich bags, so which are flat, so you've got that large surface area just to make it defrost more quickly, because obviously the longer it takes to defrost, the bacteria in it will start multiplying. So the, the key is to get it to defrost as quickly and safely as possible. I don't know whether you've got any more practical tips, Abby. Well, I might, I might just pick up on the sandwich bags because uh, I thought this was great when I heard this. Thought, right, let's fill a load of sandwich bags and go with it. However, they stick together, so you need to make sure that you put something between them to stop them doing that. Uh, and you have to be quite careful, okay? Don't be rough with these things because they will bust in, in the freezer um, and they can be quite interesting now when you're defrosting, but they, they are very good ways of doing it. We keep um, lots of small plastic bottles whatever they may be, um, you know, little drinks, bottles, milk cartons, they're really good because you can, you know, you can just have sort of 120 mils in a bottle and just get quite a few of them out and they'll defrost quite quickly. Um, so we just tend to use those. But yeah, sandwich bags are a good idea if you can work out how to keep them separate. Brilliant. So I've got two more questions on colostrum, actually. So uh, what's the best way on farm to ensure everybody adheres to col good colostrum management? Any top tips from both of you? If you're, if you're number one top tip on how to make sure everybody adheres to that, what would it be? Well, I, I suppose from my point of view, um, I mentioned we're quite an urban farm. So actually a lot of our team are from a non-farming background and helping them understand why we do what we do gives them a huge amount of pride in you know, saying, especially when you say to them, 
um, you know, do you remember that calf that you saw born a month ago? Look at it now, it's doing really well. It's, it's just really trying to help people feel involved. Um, and it was a little bit of a eureka moment for me, really, when I suddenly thought, gosh, I will say to people, if you see a cow carbon, please, can you get a colostrum out? And everybody was happy to help. So I think if you've got a good team ethos and everybody's going in the same direction, then they, they enjoy taking on that responsibility. Great. Anything from you, Jess, on that one? I think the only thing I would add um, is just to have your sort of standard operating procedures for colostrum and, you know, every aspect actually up on the wall where everybody can see. So no matter who's coming in to feed the calves, whether it's the weekend, the weekday, um, it's very clear to see you've got your protocols up on you know, whiteboards or posters on the wall. So everybody can just sort of um, know what's meant to be happening. Great. And another one on colostrum here is um, many vets say feeding three to four litres of colostrum within the first hour. Surely the abomasum isn't that big so early and could give rise to issues. Any any comments on those? I would just say on that that um, I think the, the abomasum has got sort of a much bigger capacity than we probably think sometimes and there is there's one piece of research showing that when they fed sort of six and a half I think it's 6.8 litres in one feed they didn't actually get any sort of overflow into the room and the abomasum could hold it um, so it is possible and I think um, you know in terms of thinking you know we still say three litres but the question is sort of about four litres but um, you know again the recommendation is three litres or actually 10 percent of body weight and for many of these calves you know they are 40 kilos plus at birth so we probably should be um, getting more like four litres into a lot of these bigger calves at birth and there shouldn't be any problems in terms of the abomasum being able to um, hold that capacity. Yeah I think the only thing I can add to that is I, I try and bottle feed our calves as opposed to stomach tube just it's just a preference but you know I'll have a calf that will take um, we've got bottles that hold just shy of three litres and I'll have a calf that will drink two and a half of those bottles. They don't all do that, but some do. So th there must be, they're voluntary taking it. So there must be the capacity there somewhere. I think that's really interesting. Um, and I've got one here, Abby, this is for you. Um, quite a personal question, I think. But uh, what do you vaccinate on farm for? I've got a couple of people have asked me that. Yeah, um, with the carbs, we just vaccinate with um, um, Risperval for, for pneumonia. Um, and then once they get to five months old, then we will do a BVD vaccine. And that's it. We don't do Rotavac. Um, I'm trying to think whether I'm missing out any other. We'll do a black leg, obviously, but that's that's later on when they're going out. So, yeah, with carbs, it is literally pneumonia. And quite often... That is only for about seven months of the year, the, the winter months. We won't necessarily do it through the summer. And in all honesty, probably if I didn't have TB, um, we might not vaccinate at all because our stocking rates would be a lot lower. So it it's just trying to use what you can to help alleviate stress or pinch point situations. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, a couple more um, and then we can we shall close. But can you carve heifers at less than 23 months? Jessica, I'm going to pass this one straight to you. You can, um, again, the, the important thing is actually their size. So as long as that heifer has grown well and hit the sort of target of 55 to 60% of mature body weight at first breeding, and then is carving down at 85 to 90% of mature body weight, then you can carve them younger. And um, again, I think it's quite popular sort of overseas in America in particular, but the word of caution is that if they don't have adequate body size and you're carving them down younger, then that heifer is actually going to have to continue to grow to a greater extent in her first lactation. And what then tends to happen and what we found in um, sort of my work during my PhD was that those younger carving heifers, because they weren't big enough, they then put all of their sort of um, resources into the growth at the expense of their fertility. So then they had problems getting back in calf in that first lactation and then didn't survive through into a second calving. So, yes, you can as long as they're big enough, but if they're not big enough at 55 to 60 um, if yeah, if they're not 55 to 60 percent of mature body weight at first breeding, just hold back a little bit. And that's really interesting. And on that note on growth, to increase growth, should I be increasing the mixing weight of uh, a milk replacer 
or increasing the actual milk replacer volume into my calf is a question I've heard come in as well. Okay. Again, it, it depends on your system to an extent. I mean, ultimately, you can do either. Um, and if you're if you're currently mixing at 12 and a half percent solids, you can take that up to 15 percent. So sort of 150 grams of powder plus 850 mils of water to give you one litre. Um, so that is fine. Uh, but if you're already at 15% and you're wanting to get more into those calves, you think they need a little bit more to double their birth weight by weaning, then sort of the only option then is to increase volume. Um, as I said during my presentation, you do need to keep an eye on um, milk per feed, the volume being offered. So you don't really want to go above three litres per feed. Um, so again, if you're going to go to the bigger volumes, little and often is key. Um, but Ultimately, the thing to sort of keep an eye on is actually the total amount of milk solids being provided each day, and, and you can increase that either by increasing the volume or increasing the mixing rate. Brilliant, thank you very much. So, um, I've got a couple of comments on things that I've picked up today, but some somebody's put something in the chat. I don't think everybody can see it. Um, going back to calf jackets, um, and it says here that work at AFB showed a seven degree difference in skin temperature um in for calves in jackets for those that are wearing no jackets because of the little micro environment that it creates so while i haven't got any information on that might be something good for for those on the call if they wanted to to go and look into so the other thing that i've picked up from the polls is um you know we had a great response on age at first calving which really shows that you know to get that average of 28 to 29 um months at age at first calving there still must be many many people calving at, at 30 months and, and later so thank you so much for joining us today um before we close i would like to come back to the polls that unfortunately wouldn't show on my screen at the beginning and um i've been told that actually 69 percent of you said that sustainability was very important to you which for me really shows that all of those of us involved in the industry really need to to do more to ensure that not only is are we all following sustainable practices such as getting the most out of your calves, efficient calf rearing, etc. But also, you know, to ensure for a sustainable industry, we all need to be you know, helping each other out, using the best resources and sharing resources that we can. And um, if you would like to have any more information on anything we've discussed today or any of the questions we didn't get to, please do hop over to our social media channels, which are Feed for Growth on Facebook and Twitter. You can, of course, also email in at feedforgrowth at volac.com. Um, and please don't forget to sign up for tomorrow's calf strategy event, which is with AHDB strategic dairy farmer Gareth Owen on dairy calf health and management. And on that, I'd just like to thank um, Abby Reader for joining us today and offering um, her insights and you know her experiences on farm because I think it's incredibly important that we share this information with everybody and of course Jessica for for her presentation and all the work she's put in um, to bring this to everybody today so thank you all very much for joining us <laughs>